I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my journey in traditional archery, and it's been a long one. Uh, I've been shooting this year, we'll make 77 years that I've been shooting a, a bow, a traditional bow. I've never owned a compound, uh, but uh, having said that, compounds did a lot to uh, popularize archery because I think it got a lot of people started in archery and then, and then from there they, they got into uh, traditional archery. But, uh, and, I, and I attribute the fact of my early start uh, to my mother. Uh, when I was born in 1936, now you, if you're real good at math, you can figure that out. Uh, there was no television. We had limited radio. My mother was an avid reader, so she used to read stories to me, books, ch chapter by chapter at bedtime. Every night at bedtime, it was, you know how hard sometimes to get a kid to go to bed? Well, I always looked forward to going to bed because mom was going to read another chapter. And uh, she liked uh, history, American history, and westerns, and Indians, and frontiersmen, and, and things like that. Well, one year my grandmother got me a book, the book of Robin Hood, and my mother started reading uh, Robin Hood to me chapter by chapter. And, and the idea of Robin Hood's feats and the longbow just really struck a chord in me, and uh, I was smitten by archery at the age of five years old. So uh, my first bow, of course, was like any kid, was one of those little bows that you get on a card with the suction cup arrows, and back then they weren't plastic, they were wood. And I uh, started shooting arrows into the mirrors in the windows inside the house, and very soon got kicked out into the outdoors, where that little bow uh, didn't shine very good. So my dad, uh, his hobby was uh, woodcraft, and he liked to make things, so he made me a bow and some arrows, and and uh, that got me going, and I was out shooting every day. I was kind of a different kid. I was almost like a little wild boy, I guess, because uh, my, <laughs> again, my mother reading, reading these stories to me, I had to have a, a loincloth, and my dad made me a wooden knife, and I had my little bow, so I was running around the yard with this outfit on. But eventually I ended up uh, uh, hunting along the, the creek behind the house and shooting at frogs, and... I'm sure I missed most of them, but one day I came home with a couple frogs and my dad said, well, now that you've killed these frogs, then we're going to have to eat them. So he, he showed me how to cut the legs off and skin the legs. And, and I can, uh, even though this has been that long ago, I can still remember in my mind to seeing those little frog legs kicking in that frying pan. And we sat down at the table, my dad and I, and we ate those little frog legs. And that was the day that I became a hunter. I, was, I had killed something with my bow. We had eaten it, and I, I was a hunter. Uh, from there, when I was uh, nine years old, uh, we, uh, we moved to, uh, to a farm, and I got my first real bow, which was, uh, I think we got it at through the catalog, Sears, Roebuck, Montgomery Wards, I don't know what, but it was, and it was probably Lemonwood, and a set of arrows, and uh, so I had my first real bow, and uh, I had a pony named Scout, and I had a little Indian outfit with a headdress, and boy, I was set, I'll tell you. Uh, and, and then later on, when I was 11, my folks sent me to a, to a summer camp, boys camp, and they had different events there, uh, uh, swimming, woodcraft, uh, riflery, archery, uh, and, you, and you were supposed to have a different class every hour and go to these different events. Well, they, when I got to the archery class, I was so uh, enthralled by shooting this beautiful, I can see it today, it was a dark English style longbow. Might have been Osage, maybe you, but anyway, I, uh, that was the bow that I, I shot. And uh, after the hour was up and I'm supposed to go to the next class, I didn't want to go. I stayed there for the new, new, next group to come in. I shot with them. The next group come in, I shot with them, the next group, and so on. All day long, I stayed in the archery class and I didn't want to go anywhere else. I found out later, my, I remember my dad saying he got a, a long distance phone call, which was a big deal back then, from the camp director. And the camp director told him, he said, we're having a little problem with your son. And my dad said, uh-oh, what do you do now, you know? And then, 
So uh, he said, well, he, all he wants to do is shoot the bow and arrow. He won't participate in anything else. And I, my dad, my dad said, yeah, he really likes his bow. I said, he said, well, that's okay. If that's what he wants to do, just let him do that. So I, I shot the bow and arrow most of the time in camp. And at the end of uh, our stay in camp, they had kind of a shoot off and for score. And I got the highest score in camp. And I've still got the certificate today from 1947 when I was 11 years old and I think I, I won because uh, I got more practice than everybody else. But uh, from there the bow stayed with me uh, when I was 16. I remember I, I bought a, a, a used Parex aluminum bow from a, uh, from a second hand store and uh, Used to by that time we'd moved off the farm. We'd moved into town, and there wasn't really any place to shoot uh, except uh, out on this golf course. And uh, so I would just shoot wherever I could find a place to throw arrows. But anyway, it progressed until uh, 1955 is when I started uh, bow hunting for deer in in Upper Michigan. And then by that time, I I bought a brand new. 1955 Bear Kodiak. Back then, you could, they had a shelf on either side. You could shoot either side. My uncle, who was a uh, hunting and fishing guide in Upper Michigan, and he uh, he told me at the time, he said, uh, Bear Archery is coming out with a new broadhead. And he f learned this from Fred Bear himself because he had guided Fred Bear uh, trout fishing on the Jordan River up there. So anyway, my uncle took me back to a place where... Uh, where he said was a good place to hunt in the, in, the, in the woods up there. And I remember the first time I went out with my brand new bow and my brand new arrows and, and uh, walked out in the woods and I just picked a good spot, sat down on a log, put an arrow on the string and I sat there and I waited and pretty soon here come a deer. And I started to get excited, you know, my heart started hammering and I, the closer the deer got, the harder my heart pumped. And finally, by the time the deer got in a position where I could shoot, I was shaking so bad. I don't, I have no idea where the arrow went, but it, uh, I remember uh, that was my first shot at a deer and my first case of buck fever. Uh, so, uh, but that, that's when I started and, uh, and it, it, it just stuck with me and continued with me until uh, my later years, I, I, I got another bow, which was a little bit lighter weight target bow and, and uh, I started carrying my bows around uh, in my car with me because wherever, you know, I might get a chance to shoot somewhere. And at the same time, I was in my early 20s and I was dating, you know, and looking, uh, looking the ladies over. And, uh, and, uh, but I found out uh, at that time that when you started talking to girls about hunting and bows and arrows, you know, they started rolling their eyes and they lost interest real quick. So uh, until I met uh, my then-to-be wife, Nancy, and uh, she, had, uh, she had been to some archery tournaments because her first cousin had been a national champion in uh, 1953, I believe it was. So uh, we, we hit it off right away, you know, and uh, uh, I ended up buying her a, a bow. It was a 39-pound bow, and Nancy was... Uh, living, uh, working in Lansing, Michigan, uh, uh, in a loan, for a loan company, and she was living in an apartment with three other girls above a doctor's office, and they had a driveway that went up between the buildings there in a, in a garage, and I put some straw bales in the back of the garage, and so every day after work, she would uh, come home from work and, and get her bow and, and stand in the driveway and shoot up the driveway into, into the garage, and by, by fall, she was ready to go hunting. So, and uh, that was 1958, and we were married in 1959, and she was my hunting partner from then on. And then from there, I met, uh, there was a, I, I met a guy at work, name of Carl Youngs, and he was quite a bit older than I was, but he was a, he was a bow hunter. And he, when he found out I liked to bow hunt, why we kind of started talking, and he got me into, uh, joining uh, his local archery club and uh, so we started going to some shoots together and uh, one day we went he took me to a to a shoot at the Detroit Archers in Detroit Michigan which just happened to be the home club of Fred Bear 
and I remember uh, we were we were at the shoot and we were walking from the from the practice range to the clubhouse and I saw this tall guy coming out of the clubhouse and he turned and he started coming toward us and I had never seen Fred Bear except in pictures and uh, and I said Carl that looks like Fred Bear and Carl just smiled and as the man came closer and closer and, and pretty soon he saw Carl and his face lit up and he said hi Carl how you doing and they shook hands and come to find out Fred Bear was a good friend of my friend Carl they were uh, both charter members in the Michigan Bow Hunters, and uh, so Carl introduced me to Fred. And uh, after that, uh, my friend Carl grew about six inches because suddenly I was a friend of a friend of Fred Bear. And uh, of course, I saw Fred quite a few times after that. He would always show up at different events because he was in Michigan at that time. And uh, we just uh, went from there, and I and I got kind of involved from in the 60s in, in uh, competition target archery. And uh, still, still bow hunted with my, with my instinctive bows, but uh, I, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the competition of, of the target archery. And it, it taught me a lot on what it takes to be, to shoot a bow accurately. But uh, some of the things that I learned in, in target archery was about good form and uh, there was a fellow that I met uh, in the 60s uh, that came to Michigan to shoot in the, in the shoot at Detroit at the Cobo Hall. It was an indoor international open event. And uh, I'll back up a little bit. At that time, there was, there was a guy named Dave Keege Sr. who wrote a book called Power Archery. And it was, it was all about... Uh, you know, push pull, powerful explosion upon release, open stance, and all this kind of thing. So he had everybody in the country shooting this power archery style, including me. But then there was this fellow, he was from Utah. His name was Jim Pickering, and some of you older guys may have heard the name before. Jim Pickering had never read the book Power Archery. And he rode the bus from Utah to come to Michigan to shoot. Now Jim had a different style. It was what we call today the a dead release style. And I was I was there the day that he shot, and uh, I watched him shooting, and I was really impressed the way the way he shot because he uh, he shot with a with a high anchor instead of the low under the chin target anchor anchor. And uh, when he released, nothing moved except the limbs of the bow. His head didn't move, his hand didn't move, it stayed against his face. So when you were watching him, when he released, it was like the string slipped through his fingers and, and only the limbs of the bow moved. And Jim kicked butt that day. I mean, he, <laughs> he beat everybody. That's awesome. And Jim later went on to win many championships, and I had the privilege of shooting with Jim when he moved to Michigan. I was shooting with Jim uh, on the Michigan team uh, at Cobo Hall in 1966. And uh, back then everybody called him Gentleman Jim because he was such a really kind of a quiet, unassuming guy, you know. And, and uh, But then we had uh, Dickie Roberts, who was a national champion, I was, and he was on the Michigan team that year with us. And uh, I got to shoot with Jake, with Dickey, and against him, many times here in Michigan, and uh, at the nationals and at the state shoots, and uh, I think it was 1966 was the year that uh, we had the Michigan State Championship uh, at I think it was at Midland or Muskegon. I can't remember for sure where, but anyway, uh, and the first round was 28 targets of. Field, field targets, which were the black and white targets uh -huh. from 10 yards to 80 yards. And uh, I shot that in the morning, and when scores were all calculated, I had the high score. And then in the afternoon, we shot 28 targets of the hunter round, and uh -huh. that was a black base with white with the spots. white dot. Yeah. And after that round, Dickie Roberts, who was then the national champion, 
and he had caught up with me, and we were tied oh, at man. the end of first day Saturday. Sunday morning, we're standing on target number one, waiting for the shotgun to start. And Dickie's standing there, and he said, uh, "He said, you know, Ron, and, 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 you know, Sunday morning we're going to shoot the animal round. Now, the animal round was one arrow at an animal target, and it scored uh, 20, 16, or 8, or whatever. But uh, Dickie said, you know, Ron, he said, uh, I shot a perfect animal round to win the Nationals this year. <laughs> so I said, I looked him in the eye and I said, I know you did, Dickie. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you want to beat me, you're going to have to do it again. <laughs> but you know what? The son of a gun did. He no, shot a perfect animal round. Thanks. I dropped a couple <laughs> points, and so he took first in the state and I took second. But anyway, I learned a lot uh, from from my days of uh, shooting target archery. And... Uh, and then, I don't know, it was sometime in the late 70s, uh, you know, and as, as I told you earlier, I started my uh, archery career shooting uh, longbows. And, uh, and I, but I got into the recurves and hunted with those for probably 25 years or so. And uh, I had read the book or, of Howard Hill's book, Hunting the Hard Way, and the idea of the longbow always fascinated me. And, and, in the tales of Robin Hood that my mother used to read to me. So uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to get a longbow. So back then, the only place to get a longbow was Howard Hill Archery. So I would call Howard Hill Archery and, said, uh, and say, you got any left-handed bows in stock? And uh, Betty Eakin was the lady you talked to, which was Craig's mother, Craig Eakin's mother. And she, she would say, no, we don't have anything left-handed right now. Well, how long does it take to get one? And she said, well, about six months. Oh, well, okay, I, well, I'll think about it and I'll call back. Well, then I, would, I wouldn't order one, you know, and then maybe six months later I'd call again. And this happened several times. And finally one day I called and, and uh, said, you got anything left-handed? And she said, yeah, we do. We've got a Howard Hill Big Five left-handed. I said, oh, good. I said, uh, what weight is it? And she said, 85 pounds. <laughs> and I said, oh, good Lord. I said, I, I, I shoot 55 pounds. I don't know if I can even handle. And I had a 50-pound ball. And I said, so I said, I, I'll have to think about it. So I hung up and I got to mulling it over and I thought, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm, I can't pull 85 pounds. But then I had an idea. I said, well, let's find out. So I went and I got my 50-pound recurve. And Nancy had a 35-pound red wing hunter. I strung that, so I, I grabbed the two bows around both handles, and I grabbed both strings, and I pulled. And I got it back to my face. I got it back to 85 pounds. 50 and 35 is 85. So I called her up, and I said, I'll take that bow and a dozen arrows. So I got my uh, Howard Hill Big Five, 85 pounds. I don't remember how I got it strung, but uh, I evidently did, and uh, went out to my target, and I, sh I fired three arrows. Then I couldn't get the fourth one full draw, so I would fire three arrows and walk down and get my arrows and then walk back. By that time, the blood was back in my arms, and I would <laughs> try, try three more. And I, so I shot every day, and I think I got, I got that bow in late September. And on the 7th of October, I killed my first buck, seven-point buck, with that 85-pound Howard Hill Big Five. And that's, uh, so that's how I got started again back into the longbows, and it just kind of went from there. And I just, I've been the kind of a guy that when I get into something, I, I don't dabble in it. I get in right up to my eyebrows, you know. So I was out shooting every day, and one day I was... Uh, I was outdoors shooting under the floodlights, and it was snowing, snowing so hard that at 20 yards I could hardly see the target. And I'm out there shooting, and my wife come to the door, and she said, Ron, get in here. She said, the neighbors are going to think you're crazy. <laughs> and I said, well, they'd probably be right. But anyway, that, you know, I come in, and, and, and I told her, I said, I just, I just would rather be out here shooting. Thing. Thing. And... Uh, 
So it went on from there in, until uh, I started to, uh, I was the only guy that I knew of around that was shooting longos at that time. So I started getting guys that I was working with interested in it and uh, pretty soon we had a small group, about five of us that was uh, with longos and uh, we would get together once a week to go uh, to this local range and, and shoot bows. And uh, the first time I shot a compound, I think probably the only time I shot a compound, I was at this, uh, at this range and we were, had been shooting on the practice range and getting ready to, uh, to go out on the, on the course. And there was a guy there that, was, that had a left-handed compound and it was, it was back at the time when, I don't know if some of you remember that they had the overdraw on them. You know, you would draw the arrow or past the riser halfway back to the, and that's what he had. And he said, try this bow run. I said, nah, I don't want, I don't want. No, just try it, just try it. I want, I want to know, I want to get your opinion. So I said, okay. So I, I took it and I shot one arrow and I handed it back to him. He said, what'd you think? I said, nah, I don't like that. He said, why? He said, that's so fast. I said, that's the problem. I said, I can't even see the darn arrow. I like to watch the arrows go. So uh, anyway, we went out and shot the course. And uh, when I come back, I walked past the, tar the practice range. And here is this cardboard sign stuck on a stake. And it says, Ron LeClaire shot a compound here, and he was impressed. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I went to the clubhouse and I get a felt marker and I come out and I change impressed to depressed. And uh, so that, that was my uh, extent of the, the compound bows. And from there, I, you know, we, we ended up, a bunch of us ended up going to uh, uh, Alabama when I heard about the, the World Longbow Championship shoot down there. And I was still, still shooting heavy bows. My, by that time I had a 83 pound uh, zebra Longbow from Louis Armbruster, and I had uh, I had a 104-pound bow from Ron Malding that I was using as a kind of an exercise bow, and uh, so I I went down there and I found those guys the heaviest bows that everybody else was shooting was like 65 pounds, and I said, boy, what a bunch of wimps these guys are! You know, they're just shooting these little light bows, <laughs> and. Uh, so, but it actually, I thought, gave me an advantage because a lot of the targets were long distance, you know, and that heavy bow put them out there, but. Championship was held in Alabama, Wilsonville, Alabama, which was the home uh, town of uh, a famous uh, early bow hunter, long bow hunter, Howard Hill. And uh, Howard Hill uh, went to Africa in 1950 and killed uh, big game uh, lions and elephants and so forth and uh, his uh, one of his relatives uh, Jerry Hill started this uh, world longbow championship shoot down there and people came from all over the world to come down there and compete in that event and I was fortunate to win that one year so uh, but it was uh, what what we did is we shot like what they call a field course where you walk through the woods and shoot at targets at different distances and these are animal targets and uh, you shoot one arrow and either you miss or you hit it. And then, of course, uh, this was a two-day event. We shoot Saturday and Sunday, and then the scores were ta uh, uh, tabulated, and, and uh, the high score won. So, uh, but that that was just one of uh, many traditional shoots that have sprung up since then. We have several of them, of them around the country now. Here in Michigan, uh, uh, traditional shoots, and when I say traditional, that encompasses longbows and recurves, which are traditional bows, but. After I got into the longbows, then my wife and I started going around to the shoots and, and promoting longbows. And I, we used to put out a table with bows laying on the table. And, and uh, I, was, uh, I rented some Howard Hill shorts. Back then, you could only get the, the Howard Hill films on uh, 16, I think it was 16 millimeter film. And I would show them on a screen. And then I had, uh, I got my first video camera around that same time it had a big power pack that you hung on your side and a big camera that you set up on your shoulder anyway I would videotape these Howard Hill shorts and then I would play them on my TV monitor on, on the table and I think I was one probably one of the first guys to use a, uh, a TV monitor at, at a show but 
Anyway, people would come along and they would watch Howard Hill do, doing his trick shooting and uh, some, of the, some of the short parts from, from Tembo. And, and uh, one day, at, it was Anderson Archery's Bow Hunting Clinic, Clinic, which was in Grand Ledge, Michigan. And, and that's, that was one of the biggest shoots around where everybody came, all, all the, the big people in the industry. And uh, this guy come walking through and he would stand out in the island. He would watch Howard Hill shooting and for five minutes or so. And then he'd walk away and pretty soon, maybe 15, 20 minutes, he'd come back. He'd stand there again. About the third trip around, I asked him, I said, do you want to try a long bone? He said, well, I'm, I'm left-handed. And I said, I got a lefty here. So we grabbed a bow and <coughs> went over to the target practice range there and and uh, he fired his first arrow, and it was dead center in the bullseye. And he said, wow, he said, that felt so good, and that was so much fun. And so he said, uh, he says, I'm going to come over to your place tomorrow. And uh, so he did. He showed up and, uh, with, with his wife and came over to the shop and, and bought his first longbow. And it was Jerry Brum of uh, Great Northern Longbows. And Jerry at that time owned uh, a big hardware in Nashville. He ended up selling the hardware and going into business building bowls. So every once in a while, I, I, I tease him a little bit about how I changed his life. And, and uh, he admits it. He says, yeah, yeah, you did, Ron. Let's see, about 1980, there was a guy named Fred Trost who was just starting a starting up an old program, an outdoor program called Michigan Out of Doors. And that's where a lot of these old videos you see of me on YouTube, that was uh, from excerpts from those shows. And uh, we were at a, uh, at, uh, it was actually a Michigan Bow Hunters uh, rendezvous, the first rendezvous here in this area. And Fred Trost come walking through there and he introduced himself and uh, I had a bunch of bows laying out on the table. I was promoting promoting my my sport with uh, uh, selling uh, longbow magazines and and uh, showing bows and stuff and so anyway Fred come up and he said I hear you guys can shoot stuff out of the air and I said oh yeah we have fun doing that and he said I've got a camera guy here I said he said can we go out in the field here and get some video of that and I said well yeah sure so anyway we go out in the field and back then we I used to take for targets I used to take uh, the the tops off from uh, three pound coffee cans. Take two of them and wire them together, and then we would toss them up and shoot at them with flu flus. And then of course we'd shoot at uh, balls and stuff. And then I uh, had done some shooting at coins also. So I was did some shooting at the at the discs and stuff. And uh, and I was Fred was asking a bunch of questions and I was telling him about Howard Hill and how he made his living shooting the bow and how he used to shoot stuff out of the air like that. And, and uh, I said he would even shoot coins. He would shoot uh, silver dollars, half dollars, quarters, nickels, and dimes. He says, wow, he says, really? He says, how come nobody's doing that today? And I said, well, we're trying to. And he said, have you ever shot a coin out of the air? And I said, yeah, once in a while we can hit one. And, and he says, well, can we try that now? So we did. Well, anyway, I hit a 50-cent piece on camera, put that on his show. And he got, he got kind of the traditional archery bug. And we, just, we got a lot of publicity on a lot of his shows. And, uh, and that's where a lot of these old videos come from today. When we got, was trying to get uh, traditional archery more popular, I used to do shooting demonstrations and demonstrate to, to what could be done with a traditional bow. And, and I w emphasize the fact that uh, we all have an instinctive ability to be able to shoot a bow without sights. And so, uh, by, and then by demonstrating uh, uh, shooting a bow, shooting stuff out of the air, it, uh, it, it put emphasis on that and, and got a lot of people say, yeah, it looks, it looks fun. We'll try that. So, uh, and it just kind of took off and grew from there. So. Then I, I wanted to start a longbow club in Michigan, so I had an idea, you know, that if we could get everybody together and, and form a club. So that's what, that's what we did, and uh, uh, our, our first group that we got, we had about 40 members signed up, 
and that was uh, the first uh, first membership of the Michigan Longbow Association. And we had a few small shoots, and then then I thought, well, you know, maybe we can get some kind of a national uh, shoot, and and get people from other parts of the country to come. So in 1985, we started the the. Uh, Great Lakes Longbow Invitational. And I thought, to get people here to come to this shoot, I've got to get some people that they've only heard about but never met. So I got guys like Dick Robertson, Jay Massey, John Strunk, and a few other people to come and advertise that, that, that they were going to be there. In our first shoot, we thought uh, we would have 100 or so, you know. We ended up with 500 registered shooters, and it just grew from there. And then it was so successful that other states and other organizations decided to do the same thing. So it started a, a trend of traditional, uh, traditional shoots. So, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's how it grew. And uh, I think the Michigan Longbow Association is in its, I don't know what, 30, 30 some years now. And, uh, and still going strong. They still have the Great Lakes Longbow Invitational there every year, and it's still still a great event. And it's but it's always been longbows, just longbows. And uh, most of the other shoots, you know, they're they're all traditional. You can shoot recurves, longbows, whatever you want. Uh, it was in the sometime in the early '90s. Uh, Gary Holmes, he was from Virginia, and he he had a bow on his table that kind of intrigued me. And it reminded me of a of a bow that I had seen years ago, back in the '60s, in in one of the old archery magazines. The handle design had a forward, what I call a forward handle. And I said, I said, I just really like this this look and this design. And I said, and, and it's not only it not only looks good, but it's functional. I said, if you get your hand forward in a bow, I said, you you're it's harder to torque that bow. So. Anyway, I got to talk with Gary, and I said, uh, and, and eventually I said, well, how short can you make it one of these bowls? And, and, well, how short do you want it? And I said, well, just, you know. So anyway, that's how it got started. And uh, we ended up with the, the first shrews, which were, uh, I think, he got down to 52 inches, and then 54, and later on 56. But that's that's when they, uh, when the shrews first got, got introduced. And Back then, that that was a real, you know, it was really different because everybody, oh, yeah. nobody was shoot. They were they had transitioned into flat bows and uh, flat bows, but they were like sixty four inches was about the shortest they were. The shrew was more of a, it wasn't a wide limbed longbow, and it, and it just uh, uh, with a, with a forward handle and the short riser, it you you could. Uh, Take a take a bow that was 52, 54 inches long, and draw it at a normal 26, 27, 28 inch draw length, and not have it stack on you. If you took a hill style bow and shortened it down to uh, 56 inches, it would it would start stacking. You know, at about probably about 24 inches. And uh, so anyway, it was it was just an idea that I had, and they they have evolved. Uh, uh, John McCullough. Uh, was the one that I went to to because John was close by here and and, and it was building self bowls, wood bowls, and uh, I said, John, you want to start making glass bowls? I said, I got an idea for a bow and I wanted I wanted to a super shrew. So John and I came up with that idea for the super shrew and and it's, it basically hasn't changed that much since then. Around 1990, I had a chance to get some property up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And it was a long way from home. It's uh, about 400 and some miles up there across the across the Straits of Mackinac, and then take a left and go way down. But uh, we, I went in with some other guys, and we we had a chance to buy 400 acres uh, at a pretty reasonable price back then. Uh, and uh, so, and, and it's 400 acres with a trout stream that goes down through it. Some years after I uh, we got the property. We, uh, I found a, I was, I used to go up there and camp in tents, and then I got a little trailer, and then um, one year, I think it was about 2000, uh, I found this 
cabin, old cabin that was for sale. It was sitting along the highway. Somebody had bought several of them. They were built in 1936 by the CCC and they were made out of tamarack logs, vertical logs, tongue and groove hardwood floors. Nice little cabins and uh, they, they had them for sale so I bought one. And we had it moved in into our property there. And uh, so then by that time I was, uh, you know, making and using the shrew bows so I called it shrew hay. And uh, I wrote this little thing about it uh, uh, a while back. It's on my website and I'll read it to you. Nestled in a secluded valley, far off the beaten path, on the banks of a small stream is a little cabin called Shrew Haven. Originally built in 1936, this rustic pine cabin was only recently moved to its current location. The original intent was to just have a hunting camp, a place to hang your hat and your bow. But Shrew Haven has become more than that, much more. Shrew Haven has revealed itself an enchanting environment where the bow hunting experience is enhanced tenfold. It's a place of peace and tranquility, a place where a person can recharge their spirit, feed their soul, and share wonderful times with fellow bow hunters. In today's modern world, we have created for ourselves an unnatural environment, but God created man to be part of nature, and although we may survive in our big cities and urban neighborhoods, we need the wilderness to help keep us mentally healthy. True Haven is an oasis where we must return as often as we can to drink deep of its healing waters and thus be sustained until we come to this place again. And that's the place I go every fall for 10 days with eight of the best friends I've ever had in my life. And uh, we just have a great time. This is kind of a, a life story it's called A Boy's Dream, A Man's Life. The bow and arrow spoke to me when I was five years old. It said, come play with me, young lad, if you should be so bold. The singing string and whispering shaft was music to my soul. I knew it was a part of me when I was 12 years old. The bow was small for a lad so tall as I grew so long and lean. A new bow I sought and finally bought when I turned 16. The years they flew, and at 22, a bow for the bride I took. Together we hunted for white-tailed deer from our camp by a babbling brook. Soon a little bow hung alongside the bows of mom and dad, then another, and still another, three little bowmen we finally had. As time went by, the children grew, then grandchildren came along. Once again, the longbow sang its captivating song. This new generation was soon to learn the wonders of stick and string. They watched as Grandpa showed them the joys the bow could bring. No one can count the arrows that this old man has sent to flight. Someday he'll shoot his very last shaft into the murky night. But for now, there's great-grandchildren to teach before my time is through. This old man still loves his bow at the age of 82.